Uh, thank you everyone for coming tonight to Broom Foodie, the spirit of Costco with Josh Goldman. Um, <laughs> my name is Sandy and I'm the Assistant Director for Young Alumni Engagement. Um, our team, we're full-time professional staff and our team is responsible for bringing you um, amazing events like House Hunters, um, uh, Silicon Beach Panel, and of course our Broom Foodie series. This is our third in our Green Foodie series, and we have the honor of hosting it here at Fox Campus. Our guest of honor tonight is Mr. Josh Goldman here, and he is a cocktails extraordinaire. He started off as a bartender and is now an entrepreneur, um, a restaurant owner, and he's, he's here to share with us his story. Um, why don't you start by uh, telling us a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm Josh, uh, Sagittarius, long, long, long walks on the beach at Pulsar. Um, I, uh, I like drinking so much I made a career. Um, some people stopped in college and I just kept, uh, kept going and used my education further. So, how did someone who grew up on the East Coast end up as a Bruin? A lot of bad life decisions. Um, I, uh, I was born in, uh, in St. Louis, Missouri and, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, and uh, my, my dad and my stepmom, uh, when I was, was it, after grade school, I uh, did grade school in, uh, in uh, St. Louis, but uh, their families, my, my family originally from New York, um, they were really transfixed on the idea of owning a brownstone. And didn't really care where in New York they owned that brownstone. So in the late 80s, I got moved to Bedford Stuyvesant in, uh, in Brooklyn. So my, uh, my parents would own their, their brownstone. They lived, they worked in Manhattan, and then I you know, went to school in, uh, in Bedford Stubbs, um, junior high, high school. My high school was uh, George Westinghouse. It was uh, called Hip Hop High because uh, Jay-Z, Buster Rhymes, like, it was just, uh, uh, Biggie went to it, uh, didn't graduate. But, uh, <laughs> fun fact, would have been a senior when I was a freshman. Oh, did you perform with him? Did I? All the time. <laughs> All the time. The underground rap scene in Brooklyn would be nothing without me. That's, why That's actually what we're going to talk about. <laughs> My role in the underground. Right, you started off in craft cocktails and made it up with a pop tart. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, another fun fact. You have a degree in history from UCLA, but you weren't always a history major. I wasn't. Um, you started off with biochemistry, and before you were brewing, you were at the University of Maryland. So why the, why the switch in, in studies and focus? Um, well, after, uh, after New York, went in the Army, um, got out of uh, the Army, decided I wanted to uh, go to college. Um, started going to the University of, uh, of Maryland because I had moved to D.C. It was, just like, you know, it was, it was close and, and uh, convenient, and they accepted me. <laughs> so, um, started going there and I got really interested in, uh, I was always pretty good at math and science and I got really interested in the idea of being uh, a doctor. And uh, my dad was really, really keen on that one too. Um, DC uh, was the start of my bartending career. Um, back in 96 I got my first job. Uh, Bartending at a nightclub. Bartending was always a way to, like, you know, instead of dealing drugs, to put myself through college <laughs> um, and uh, and support myself. So I started uh, started with that. Uh, Wisconsin happened as a as a fluke. <laughs> I just kind of ended up being there, and then once again getting accepted into the university and. And all of a sudden, I was this kid from New York and, and been overseas, like in, in the army, and moved back to like you know, and moved to DC, and then I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, and there's like cows 45 minutes out, like outside of that. It's uh, definitely a bit of a culture shock. But this time, I'm still in the uh, National Guard. Okay. Um, so you made it all the way to the West Coast. And how did you decide that UCLA was the place for you? Because UCLA accepted. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, well, I um, I left I left Wisconsin and came out here. I dropped out of 
Wisconsin so I no longer had the desire to be a doctor. Um, Why not? Well, my, uh, it was a very interesting time in my life. My, uh, my son, who's 15 now, um, was, uh, was born around this time. His mother and I weren't uh, in, the best of, uh, in the best of situations. So like so many decisions in my life, I turned to the great Tom Cruise classic cocktail for guidance. <laughs> and I was going to move to Jamaica and go bartend uh, when I dropped out. But I had a buddy of mine say, uh, I'm moving to Southern California to be a model and an actor. Why don't you come with me? I was like, sick, never been before. So I uh, got out here, and um, I had spent all this time you know, working on my undergrad. I figured I might as well uh, finish it up. And then uh, because, because of the, um, the, the attrition, all the what UCLA would accept from Maryland, Wisconsin, and whatever, it was like uh, kind of just became easier to become a history major, which is something that I'd always like actually like you know like had a, a love for, but never actually thought you could do anything because I was always like you know like well you know you got to do something with like you know like science or become an accountant or like you know, this is I need to learn some skill other than like you know like bartending or shooting at people like that's going to prepare me to the business world out there. So like you know history and like liberal arts really never ever you know dawned on me as a career um, as anything I could actually like, you know, like make money from or like use <laughs> for that matter. Um, but you did start it uh, with using history degree as part of your career. I did, um, absolutely. And, and how was that? Um, I, uh, I get really, really geeky about like things that I'm especially you know, interested in, like in a very introspective about things, like I'm sure. You know, we all we all do with things that like you know like pique our interest, and you know like kind of just peeling back the layers of things, and like you know like following that like kind of scientific method that I grew up on, you know, in school, and like you know kind of like you know peeling the layers and scratching scratching the scab, whatever, uh, just needing to know as much as I possibly could about everything, and then um, I just started like you know like. Being able to draw all these like you know like uh, amazing par uh, parallels, and at first it, it was you know fermented and distilled spirits were you know like cool and fun and romantic, and they had a mystique about them, and they got you drunk, and that was awesome. It was my twenties, got you laid, <laughs> fantastic. So, but I never really like you know kind of understood the importance of it. You know, it was just a, a feeling that I had something that was like you know like fun to do um, then later on with uh, you know with, like the skills I learned you know as a as, you know doing you know being a researcher at UCLA you know working on my my degree you know like really helped me dig into craft cocktails and this is kind of a, uh, a resurgence this isn't uh, this isn't something new this is actually something that we're looking to our past our pre-prohibition um, you know, ancestors in this uh, in this craft too. This was uh, cocktails, bartending. This was this is our culinary gift to the uh, to the world. Europeans you know, definitely say like you know, that we you know, it could be a travesty when we mess up their uh, their beautiful spirits by mixing them together. But what are they? <laughs> um, it's uh, it's just prohibition. The noble experiment, experiment we had, we all know that are like, you know, with our failed war on drugs and everything else. Like, prohibition doesn't solve anything; it just like you know, makes it more dangerous and uh, more like basically unsafe when you're talking about um, when you're talking about booze. And 13 years of like you know having that vacuum kind of uh, broke the cultural chain that we have in this country. And now we learn how to drink by getting marketed to. Um, instead of learning how to drink like the rest of the, the civilized world that never had this prohibition in their country learns how to drink from, you know, like generation to generation to generation. There's nobody around like, you know, today goes like, you know, I'm a vodka Red Bull man because God damn it, my, my father was a vodka Red Bull man and his father was a boy and was a vodka Red Bull man. You know, the, um, this, you know, this, this arbitrary age of like, you know, like 21, my dad always like, you know, like, you know, I went, 
I graduated high school a little early. I was 17, and my dad had assigned me you know, into the military, and he always thought it was amazing um, that I can go off and you know, like fight and die for my country, but I couldn't get a beer in my country. Um, don't worry, I got drunk overseas. And I've been sneaking into nightclubs since I was 15. Um, but um, it's, that, uh, it's that cultural shame that I got really interested in. And that's kind of when history and what I was doing made sense. There was, uh, if you want to learn anything about a culture, you know, like really truly learn something about a culture, you sit down and eat and drink with them. Um, it's one of the most amazing experiences. I've, I've been fortunate in my, my career to be sent all over the world. Um, whether it be like you know wine or spirits related, and I get to go to like you know different countries and bartend with, with you know bartenders from those countries and share experiences. And then the most important thing, and the thing that you know we all love doing, is like you know bending the elbow together and going out and you know being you know acting like we're still children. Um, you know it's a lot. It's a lot of fun when you end up meeting you know like just lifelong. Friends and you know, there's people, you know, in every corner of the world, like you know, behind, you know, behind the stick now. But like, you know, it's a, it's an amazing community. You know, it's they, we, there's very, there's, you know, there's humongous lack of like, you know, health insurance for like, you know, people in, in my industry. But when bartenders get sick, as a community, you know, we come together and donate money and do fundraisers and everything like that and support. Um, you know, it's we. You know, we are those, uh, that cultural, you know, like gatekeeper. You know, we, we offer the, the, uh, the social lubricant that, uh, that everybody craves so much. Um, and this is all really, like, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, like tied into, like, you know, like our history. Um, one of the reasons I chose to do rum in the cocktail I'm doing, and I'll talk about the cocktail and the history of that cocktail, is because really more so than any other spirit, more so than, like, you know, like gin or Cognac or, uh, you know, you know, American whiskey, whatever, will tell a story of, like, you know, like a region, but because rum is all over the world and nothing is, like, you know, told uh, the story of, uh, you know, our first great expansion, you know, since, you know, the land bridge over 10,000 years ago, then, uh, then rum is, like, you know, fueled empires and, you know, brought about, like, you know, social change, you know, evil and, you know, it all came from, you know, a byproduct of, uh, you know, sugar. And that's absolutely fascinating. Um, speaking about your community, Julian Fox is part of your community, and he's also your business partner. He's on with us tonight, but um, you guys met in 2007, and yeah. he made you, what did he make for you? Um, the first drink we ever made was a uh, Chancelier. Okay. It's, a, uh, it's a classic cocktail um, that's made with uh, cognac, Green chartreuse, uh, fresh lemon juice, and mangosteen bitters, and a little bit of uh, a little bit of simple syrup. It's a fantastic, you know, like a wonderful shaking cocktail. So he impressed you enough that you wanted to go into business with him. Well, um, not from that cocktail. Not from that cocktail. How did he's, you? He's had an amazing career of his own, and we, like, like I said, I mean, he, he's uh, we 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 were always looking for that day to the great kind of like you know like you know situation for us to work together. Um, you know, when I first met Julian, I was the general manager and beverage director of a Michelin star restaurant called like Steed, and he was working, you know, um, behind the bar at Consa, which had just opened up. It was kind of the nexus of the craft cocktail revolution, you know, kind of in Los Angeles. And kind of like all these guys started from Consa and went and opened other things. This was before Eric Alpern opened Varnish downtown. Um, and really, before Consa, it was like, you know, myself. Um, and uh, two amazing, amazing talents. Uh, Damian Windsor, who just read it, Powerhouse in Hollywood, and uh, Vincenzo Marinella, who owns Kipadora, um here in Santa Monica. Uh, but those are really the, you know, the only guys, besides myself, that were doing craft cocktails before, uh, in Los Angeles before uh, Kumsa. So how did you, um, you and Julian, how did you decide to be co both become entrepreneurs and establish Swan Acre? Um, when I, my last, the last job that I held uh, full time before we started our company uh, was I was the general manager and beverage director of Michael Vitaggio's Restaurant Inc. And we had uh, just gotten best new, um, best new restaurant in the country from GQ Magazine. 
and I was like kind of having that you know, like gut check moment with myself because you, know, you wanted to open a lot more of the ink stack sandwich shops and everything. And I really, but you know, I'm just at, at, at heart, I'm, I'm an old school beverage guy. You know, I like my I like my wine, my beer, my booze. Like you know, I hate the management part, but uh, because of the economics of you know the industry we work in, uh, management is one of those things that like you know you just have to kind of like you know, suffer for. Through. Fortunately, I became kind of like you know good at it, but you know, babysitting adults, you know, 12 hours a day really does wear on you after a while. And so I needed to get away from that. And originally, I was going to move to Chicago and, and uh, open my own bar. And when I I was consulting on um, a wine cellar for the original super agent Michael Ovitz. And I needed time to finish that up. So I just, I was bored and looking to pick up some extra cash. Asked Julian if I could fix some shifts, like, you know, behind one of his bars. And he was like, what? You left Michael? Like, what's going on? So, like, we sat down and started Swan Yeager, and I never moved to Chicago. And... I'm glad you stayed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've mentioned uh, Inc., and you've also worked with restaurants like Pizza and Church and State. Um, you also, also made a comment that no restaurant that you've consulted for has gone out of business. Is that correct? No, well, I was. No, I was. there. Um, There's been plenty of them that have, uh, like, you know, like since um, for one reason or another. But, uh, yeah. Um, so it was like before Julie and I opened Brilliant Shine, um, sat down in the math and I've actually been part of opening over 30 places in Los Angeles. So it's clear that you and Julian had such success at Swan A Group. Why the desire to open your own restaurant? It's, it's a risky business, it's a risky business venture. Why do it? Well, I mean, it is. I mean, it's extremely risky. And I mean, that's that's one of the reasons we do have our consultant, like, in our company. A lot of people, and like, the statistic in Los Angeles is like about 200 places, 200 restaurants, bars, whatever, open in Los Angeles a year, about 100 places um, every year. Um, and that's because, like, you know, you have well-intentioned people that, like, you know, found success in something else and, you know, got some money together and they decided, like, you know, open a restaurant or a bar because how hard can it be? I used to bartend back in college, or I used to wait tables back in college, and, like, you know, you don't actually know, like, all the things that, like, you know, like, that go into making a successful, you know, place, so, like, that's the beauty, of, that's the beauty of my situation is, like, you know, when, it starts to like you know like fail or go pear shaped or you want to open something, you contact like you know us and we mm -hmm. do it. Uh, you know we we do it for you. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, if you ask like you know any consultant, any anything, I mean like they might be my programs and I'm building for other people, but there's still other people's programs. You know with uh, with Brilliant Shine, I mean besides our you know, our other partners, and it uh, you know it's our it's our vision, it's our voice, and it was really like you know our kind of reaction, and that's like, you know, why we're still kind of building it out, because we're doing it with our own money. And we're doing it on like, you know, like a shoe string, because we didn't want to be in anybody's pocket. And we, you know, this is, this is what we do. We wanted, there's been a lot of people who have told us no in our careers. Um, and that, I mean, I know that sounds like, you know, like surprising, but uh, we actually, there's a lot of things that we haven't been allowed to do because people, like you know, like said, it was either like you know, like not economically viable, or like you know, nobody would understand it, or like whatever. So this is brilliant. Shine is basically our way of saying fuck you. We can do what we want. It's true spring budget or not. Your restaurant looks amazing, and for those of you who don't know, it's right here in Santa Monica on Wilshire and Fifth. Um, if you're a chance to stop by, you should. If you if you have stopped by, you know how amazing it is. Um, so what's the difference between operating a, a business like Swanee Group versus operating a restaurant like Brilliant Shine? Well, um, with our consultancy, like uh, we have uh, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different restaurants, um, bar programs, beverage programs that uh, that we consult on. Um, we're not we're not the only people that are in charge of the, the day to day operations. We basically run one portion of it, or we run like you know whatever portion of it that like you know, we've been contracted uh, to do. And you know at the end of the day, you know it's not it's not our place. It's not we're, we're only like you know filling a role. We're we're doing our part in 
their overall vision with, uh, you know, with Brilliant Shine, I mean, I, you know, I slept there for the first month every, like, you know, every, you know, open, it's, it's every, you know, everything, you know, we're doing, you know, ourselves, there isn't, um, we could have raised, you know, a lot of money um, to do it, we didn't want to raise a lot of money because you still, you have to pay back a lot of money at the end of the day, and, um, that I guess like terrified the hell out of us. <laughs> so I like your student loans. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I'll be studying a Kickstarter for you guys to help me with my student loans. Um, but uh, I mean really it's it's um, it's the amount of it's a, it's, a, it's the type of focus. Um, whereas like in our beverage programs like you know that aren't brilliant shine, that's primarily what we focus on and at Brilliant Shine that's the least of what we focus on. Um, how did you find the location for Brilliant Shine, and, and what inspired the name of Brilliant Shine? Um, well, I actually found the uh, found the location because the uh, the gentleman that owns uh, Tinga that was there before us actually lives in the Jerry Baker. has a fantastic catering company called Food Matters. Uh, another Tinga over on the Brat as well. But um, he lives in the uh, him and his wife Chris live in the biscuit company loft. So when I went down and uh, took over Church and State, and Walter Massey was the, uh, the chef, and we kind of made Church and State into what it is today. Um, Jerry and Chris lived upstairs, so we saw that transformation um, of the, you know, the restaurant. So when um, he was, like, you know, they were having some challenges, was that? Um, he, gave, he gave me a call, and we worked out a, uh, an agreement, because you know, we really didn't have any doing Tinga, but uh, the space, um, as I know, like, you know, you guys are all Bruins, I'm sure some of you guys, like, used to hang out at the old Renee's courtyard that we now occupy, um, and it was, uh, it was awesome, you know, during my, that's when I first discovered, you know, the location was my, you know, time at uh, UCLA, I actually used to live in uh, Westwood, in the corner of Daly and Weyburn, uh, that, like, old, uh, 20 style um, white building, and, um, Sundays they would have these like you know like two British guys with really really bad like Simon and Garfunkel, and it was like you know just like you know kind of a cute enough like you know like area and it was just like you know like cool enough like in the courtyard and the trees and everything like that, but still like a dive bar so it's like I could afford it as like you know like a student and a bartender I could you know like go there like on dates and like still be like you know comfortable in my dive bar like you know like atmosphere. But like, you know, girls were like, you know, comfortable with it because it's cute. <laughs> you went on a lot of dates and dive bars? I, I tried to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of, of having brunch at Brilliant and Shine. Um, and I tried a, a dish that I don't think I've ever had from brunch before, um, or actually for any meal before. Uh, it was fried rice and hot dogs. Um, and you told me about a lot of your own experiences and, and your, your childhood experiences influence the food or possibly the drinks that, that is in your restaurant now. Um, what inspires you the dishes and the drinks for, for Brilliant Shine now? Well, the, uh, I mean, at Brilliant Shine, um, just like when we opened uh, up uh, Miller's Umbrella Company with our partners over there, um, the whole idea of like, opening Miller's Umbrella Company or Brilliant Shine was uh, bars being uh, owned and operated by bartenders. Um, because really, like you know, at the end of the day, that really hasn't happened too much, uh, you know, before, um, and we wanted to make it more of a collaborative experience. So, between like you know myself, Julian, um, our program director Dean Pryor, we and our other bartenders, whoever has any ideas, like you know, we have, we kind of have a process of like you know, like submitting ideas, and then when we do R and D uh, sessions on those cocktails. We work through you know these ideas, and you know everybody comes with like, you know, exactly why their cocktails like this and the cost of their cocktails and everything like that. Julian and I work um, very closely with our amazing chef uh, Richie Lopez. Um, just uh, I mean, it's basically you know like, Richie, Richie, you know, like taste this and. That's dope. Awesome. So, uh, but, uh, the hot rice and hot rice comes from your top, right? It goes from mine and Richie's, actually. Um, in Peru, uh, when, when he grew up in Peru, it was like, you know, kind of, there's a, there's this uh, Chifa movement. There's a lot of uh, 
uh, the, the Port of Pisco used to be the largest port on the uh, on the West Coast. Um, so there's a lot of Asian you know influence uh, in there. That's where they have the kind of fried rice uh, comes from. And it was kind of like a, you know, like a poor kids dish, like in the morning, uh, the fried rice with the hot dog and the egg. And we just kind of like you know like bonded even more over this dish because my dad, you know, being a single father, you know, raising me until he got remarried. Um, you know, we would, it would be like, you know, scrambled eggs with hot dog and matzah, that's what you use. Um, you know, crumbled, you know, up into it. So it was just like so similar and it was like such an amazing dish and it's unbelievably tasty. Um, but we just thought it was amazing that like, you know, we grew up on basically the same dish and like, you know, I was in, you know, in St. Louis having this dish and he was in Peru, you know, having that version of the dish. So, I mean, it's like, that's the, that's the special part about like, you know, like about, about food and beverage. And, you know, if you don't, if you don't cook from your heart, and if you don't uh, use like you know the, that palate memory that you have, and that sense memory that you have, and like whatever, you're missing out on the joy of cooking and the joy of like you know, making, making cocktails. So I tried to recreate that dish. It did really work out, so I'll be coming back. But um, we're gonna we're getting ready for a demonstration. He's agreed to do a demonstration for us, um, and you're gonna be making a rum ricky, right? Um, is this your favorite drink? Is that why you're making it? Well, I wanted to. I don't really have a favorite drink. It, it, I have, I, have, I drink what I'm in the mood for, which is kind of like you know, the benefit of running as many bars as I do. Because <laughs> uh, I have access to so like- So you just go into a bar that you're running a clam drink? Yes. Okay. It's called quality. Okay. It's called quality. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so really, at the end of the day, my desert island drink is going to have to be a daiquiri. Um, and it's just, it's a big, you know, probably for me, like one of the most perfect cocktails I've ever made. It's, Rum, sugar, lime, um, kind of tells the, the history of the, uh, the British Navy as well. But uh, what uh, what I wanted to make for you guys uh, today is um, is a rum ricky. Now, the reason I wanted to do the, uh, the ricky is because it actually kind of like ties in like you know, um, to, to my story. Um, the ricky was actually there are a lot of cocktails that weren't invented by real people. This one actually was invented by. Uh, uh, Colonel Joe Ricky, um, and he was a Missouri politician. He's from Missouri, and then relocated in D.C. Um, loved his booze, so he came up with the Ricky. He was originally the Jim Ricky, um, and this was uh, this was created um, so Joe Ricky, Colonel Joe Ricky, was uh, stumping for Gregory Cleveland back in uh, 1893, working on his campaign and everything like that was at the, the Shoemaker in Washington, D.C. Tells the bartender um, that he wants uh, you know, gin, lime, sugar, and soda water. And, you know, the Ricky was born. By 1894, we had evidence of, like, you know, Ricky's, um, Ricky's being made with everything. And that's kind of the reason I wanted to introduce you uh, to, the, to the Ricky, because it's what we like to call like, a cocktail family. Meaning that with these, uh, these specs, these, uh, recipe, you can substitute any booze in there that you want. It doesn't have to be rum, it can be gin, it can be vodka, it can be anything at all. It, uh, it works. Plus the fact, since we have like, you know, such a long, you know, warm period here in Los Angeles, there's like really nothing better than like a refreshing, like a long carbonated drink, like on a hot day. Um, so, yeah. It's, uh, you can throw a whole party just on this You can throw a whole party just on this thing. Um, so we have our freshly squeezed lime juice. Sugar. <laughs> so this is going to be an ounce of lime juice. And then uh, simple syrup. Now we use, uh, at the bar, we use uh, evaporated cane juice sugar. You can get that from, uh, from Whole Foods. The, the reason we do that instead of like white processed sugar is because we want a little bit of that sugar flavor. It's, uh, it's going to give you a uh, much better mouthfeel. It's not going to be, you know, as molasses -y as like, you know, Demerara or Terminado or something else like that, but uh, it gives you, you know, like a wonderful, um, kind of a rich, rich feel to it. So this is going to be three quarters an ounce. Are you guys taking notes? And you make this by, um, by weight, not by volume, because like you know, sugar shifts or anything like that. So different, uh, different bottles are going to make by weight. 
Um, just one to one. Water, sugar. You can do it on. You can do it on the stove. Raise uh, raise your water to simmer, just like you know, like a good or I like old method. You just uh, take it in a uh, little soda bottle, or like whatever. And just shake it a few <laughs> times. Take about twenty minutes for it to be clear. Which is fine. Yeah. Um, you can buy you can buy the shitty simple stuff okay. like stores, but um, this this one. And then um, so the the wonderful wonderful folks at uh, Denison. Uh, donated this rum for us tonight. Um, so we have the uh, we have the aged white, which is aged uh, three year, and then we have the eight year Mercy Preserve. This is actually a 50 50. Um, we're going to do this uh, 50 50. So it's going to be two total ounces of booze, one ounce of the white. Now we're going to Two ounces of soda water. Hi. Two quick questions. So, um, the monitor 
mentioned that a lot of businesses or new restaurants actually fail in the first year. I'm so sorry? The, the moderator mentioned that a large percentage of new restaurants fail within the first year, I believe, right? Yes. So what percentage of restaurants are actually profitable, would you say, in the first year? Um, well, profitability is a matter of what type and style of restaurant that you open up. Like obviously it's gonna like take a lot longer to achieve probability of a white tablecloth fine dining um, kind of thing than you know, like say a chilies. You know, for example, it all depends on like you know, what that economic model is. The general rule of thumb, and this is just general this is just generalities that you read like you know like textbooks or whatever, but kind of um, nightclubs you can get a successful nightclub you can pay back in six months. Successful bar, you pay back in a year. Successful restaurant, you in two years. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, what are some of the key factors that one should consider when evaluating an equity stake in a new restaurant or bar? Um, well, re realize that like you know, if, just like, a, just like any vanity project, which at the end of the day, unless you are the chef or you are like a bartender or you are the principal, like you know, like talent behind it, it's gonna be it's gonna be a gamble. So realize that um, because unless you are like physically like you know, engaged and like you know like doing it, you're giving your money to other people and you're trusting their ability and their their track record, their whatever you're basing your trust off of. Um, but uh, you know, like to answer your question, it's really it really boils down to like you know like trusting the people that you're giving the money to. Um, if you feel comfortable with that, then, you know, awesome. Like, if, then hopefully they, like, you know, they, um, you know, repay that trust in, in the form of, like, you know, cash. But, uh, I mean, the thing is that there, there's a lot of, I mean, and I've seen it happen a lot. There's been, you know, like, several times that, like, you know, Julian and I have been called into a project, and it's just too late. And there's, like, you know, there's really nothing you can do. Um, you know, to save like, you know, the, the concepts um, because of, you know, numerous you know, different reasons. And like, obviously nobody, like, you know, like started, you know, to, to, to fail, but it's like, you know, everybody has, like, you know, the best intentions. Just make sure that, like, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, they wouldn't go to, you know, a hobbyist for open heart surgery. So it's pretty, pretty much the same thing. You, you go to professionals for that. Hi, my name is Carolyn, and I think you're really kind of fabulous. I oh, love it. So um, and several of your other restaurants. When evaluating projects that are pitched to you, especially for the Los Angeles market, what do you think that this market um, is most successful in this market for a restaurant with bar concept? And you talked a little bit about profitability, but when you guys are deciding whether or not to take something on or develop a new project, what are you looking for? Um, well, fortunately, um, because of the minimum amount of success that we've been able to have, we get to be very, very, very choosy uh, who we want to work with. Like, uh, you know, we don't really, not saying that we don't need money. <laughs> I'm just saying like we don't, uh, we don't chase these projects for paychecks. Um, we partnered up and we had a uh, concept opening up uh, with uh, the vertically integrated meat company called Compa, they're the world's First uh, vertically integrated, certified humane and sustainable uh, concept. They have a, a ranch outside of uh, Shasta. These are, you know, like people. They have a uh, you know, billionaire behind them that uh, really wants to like you know, kind of uh, change the way that uh, that people that people grow food, that people see food. Because right now the dialogue that we have, it's not uh, you know raise me the, the best tastiest tomato. It's raise me like you know. Like grow as many tomatoes as you possibly can on there. And basically, Bel Campo is trying to prove that flavor and you know, treating animals in a humane way and being sustainable and, and being uh, custodians you know, of the earth instead of just stripping the resources out of it and moving on, it you know, can be a um, financially viable uh, you know, venture. You know, it's basically like, you know, don't hate the, don't hate the player, don't hate the game, don't hate the Monsanto, the Cargill's, the Tyson's, and like whatever. These are just companies that have adapted to the rules that we have allowed 
to you know be be put out there. Um, what we need to do is we need to change the dialogue. We need to change uh, what uh, what people perceive as like you know like what's the right way to you know grow our food and to, uh, and to uh, to feed us and um, being good custodians of you know the planet. We have limited amount of resources. We have an abundant amount of resources, but I mean they are limited. There's only one ball that we have to live on. Eventually, like you know, the stuff uh, the stuff goes away. And future generations have to have to pay that debt. So I mean, what am, what am I looking for? And what's uh, what's Julian looking for? We're looking for like you know some. We're looking for. We're looking for love and we're looking for passion. Um, those are the projects that we want to get involved with. Um, there's been plenty of opportunities to work. You know, for us to work with brands. Um, there's been plenty of opportunities for us to like you know, like take money. You know, from people and interest and everything like that and refuse to do it and it's definitely made our path a little bit more difficult but um, you know at the end of the day I can sit here and like you know like talk shit about people are like doing it wrong because I take you know like, uh, from everybody but yeah it's it's the, it's the passion it's the love I want I want to be partners with like you know so like the way I the way I hire anybody like whether it's like you know partnering up on with is whether I want to hang out with them whether it's like you know like somebody that like I would love to like sit down with and, like have deep, long conversations about what, like, you know, like, what turns us on. Like, you know, what, like, you know, what, what do we, what do we love? We're into the same thing. Those are the people you need to get behind because, in the, re the restaurant business is incredibly tough. Like, you know, even when you know what you're doing, I still don't know what the hell you guys are gonna do when you come in. <laughs> I have no idea. Like, you know, there's, uh, I'm not a restaurant manager. I'm a personality manager. You know, I have, you know, a staff of 30. Um, you know, throughout the day at Burlington, and then we have, you know, like 150, 200 pe different people that come in, you know, throughout the, uh, throughout service, and everybody wants something different. You all have different days, and we need to be able to, like, you know, deliver that, you know, like, to you. Some days we do an amazing job, you know, we're human, some days we don't, some days, like, you know, we just won't be able to be on that wavelength. Um, doesn't mean that we're not trying, but, like, after all that, and, like, Yelp, like, you know, like, I mean, I was the most hated man on Yelp. <laughs> Literally, my staff made me a shit that said, people hate me on Yelp. <laughs> um, and when you go through, like, you know, like, all that, and the constant, like, you know, like, arguments and fights and everything that we go through, just so we can serve you dinner. I mean, it's just, like, it's a knockdown, drag out, like, you know, like, fried swell, like, seeds that, like, you know, last about 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so at the end of the day, it's like, you know, who do you want to be taking the grenades with? The fox. Or? <laughs> so you talked a lot about classic cocktails, but I was wondering what your inspiration is when you want to get creative and make something new that hasn't been done before. Um, well, I mean, I have, a, I have a saying, you need to know a Scoffier before you go Adria. So you can't uh, know in front of Adria, um, you know, like uh, Michael Vitaggio, whoever, whatever molecular, like, you know, like uh, chef, but, you know, none of them can make anything good if you don't understand, like, you know, the, the classics. So for me, like, you know, everything is, is really <coughs> classics. That's where we find like, our balance and everything like that. Finding inspiration for, uh, for new cocktails, I mean, those are, I mean, those are, like, all over the place. I mean, it's, it's, I just come up with, like, you know, like, wacky ideas. Like, you know, I had an idea a couple years ago for avocado soda, and it wasn't there, so I created an avocado coloma. Um, I had an idea for a BLT cocktail. And Betty Hollick, when she was the um, assistant editor in the LA Times, said mine could replace the actual BLT is my head. Um, you know, this was like you know the BLT. I took uh, I took cooked bacon and raw bacon. I infused them um, in a water in, uh, under vacuum in a water bath. Uh, took them out, blended them together, filtered them out, and uh, clarified tomato air on top. I had a caraway tincture that I sprayed the uh, glass with. And on the side, you had a little granita of uh, iceberg lettuce. 
So when you drank it, you got the, the bourbon, well, when you brought it up to your nose, you got that kind of like caraway rye smell. And then when you started drinking it, you got the tomato, you got the bacon, and then you got the little crunch of the, uh, of the iceberg glass on the side. Um, done cocktails with, uh, you know, carbonated reverse spheres of, of tonic water that I like, put down at the bottom of, uh, of a glass and it made, it, like, made a very aqua fresca, like, you know, gin, um, like, cucumber kind of cocktail. So when you, when you drank it, it was like, you know, like, gin and cucumber and, like, you know, lime and fresh and, uh, and everything, a little kaffir lime in it as well. And then when you got down to where the liquid was just right above the uh, pearls, you would just kind of, like, knock it back. And then uh, you'd have a uh, you'd have the tonic water, carbonated tonic water, the spheres would kind of explode in your mouth, and jam and everything like that. So it became a cucumber cocktail, cucumber gin cocktail, into a gin tonic. So we call it twofer. Um, I mean, like it's like where where inspiration comes from is like you know, like literally everything. Um, I I mean I did a uh, historical cocktail um, a menu for. Restaurant called Akbar that we consulted on in Hollywood. When they first opened, it was uh, done by historic, uh, by different historical uh, eras, and I did uh, kind of like an homage to like when I first started bartending the, uh, the dark ages. So I actually re, I actually re-engineered the uh, the apple martini, which is going to be going on the menu at Bel Campo when I when I open Bel Campo next month. Um, but I re-engineered sweet and sour, and I re-engineered apple pucker. It's got the same bricks level and the same pH, like the same acidity and everything like that. So I got a bottle of pucker and I measured the, uh, the uh, pH and the bricks with the fact on there and everything like that. And I wanted to make sure that I got the, the flavor and the balance, well, not the flavor. <laughs> so we're going to have that flavor, but I wanted to make sure that I had that, that balance of that. So it would be something recognizable when you drank my apple martini, but something completely and totally, you know, like different. <coughs> One more question. Do you think a place like Aviary in Chicago could make it out here? Um, no, I, I don't. And like, you know, the only reason I say that is because of, I think maybe ten years from now, and it has nothing to do with like in. Is it nothing to do with the palette of Angelinos? I think, I mean, I, I, I personally think that like Los Angeles was looked over um, and kind of like marginalized in the food uh, business for a long time. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be the only, uh, the only GM that uh, has earned Michelin stars at two different restaurants, uh, but that's only because they, Michelin only rated us for two years um, as a city. They stopped rating us because they don't consider us a serious food city. Um, I think that's total bullshit. I think we're the most, like, one of the most progressive food drink uh, cities around. But the reason I say it won't work is because we don't have the public transportation that uh, Chicago does. There's a lot of bar concepts that won't work here in Los Angeles that work very well in New York and Chicago and San Francisco, but we're too, we're too sprawl. Um, we, uh, I mean, I love the fact that, like, you know, the trains go in, like, literally right there. Um, where I live in Culver City, I'm gonna be able to like hop on the train, like you know, get off and like walk to you know Brilliant Shine. It's amazing. It's a New Yorker, I love that. Um, but uh, but really I mean like you know there's a lot of like you know after dinner thing there's a lot of like serious drinking that we can't uh, that we can't do here in, uh, in Los Angeles. And the thing is that it's, uh, I mean it's like where would you put it? You put it downtown, like downtown's like you know like saturated and becomes like you know another one of those things that just goes like you know side. And the other thing about like you know the aviary, well I respect everything that uh, Grash does, he's uh, absolute genius. Those aren't actually bartenders making those cocktails. Those are wine cooks making those cocktails. So um, at the end of the day, like the thing is that like you know this like you know like aviary's cocktails as you know a fine dining experience. Um, I'm not really interested in that like, like anymore. Like one of the reasons I have a beard and I don't like you know work at Double Winds or not like you know like tie to work anymore. I work in that mission system is because I just think it's perpetuating bullshit stereotypes. Um, 
And, uh, and one of the reasons, like, you know, Tajio and I, like, you know, opened up Inc. was because you have people coming in and, like, saying, you know, it's like, you know, we save up, like, you know, for six months to, like, you know, come and see you guys. And I just don't think that, like, you know, dining should have to be like that. Um, fine dining, refined dining, good dining shouldn't be, like, you know, the domain of, like, you know, the rich. Everybody should be able to, everybody should be able to experience it and they, like, you know, need to experience it. But, like, unfortunately, things that are, like, you know, that specialized really need a city um, that will kind of embrace it. Because, like, you know, that, that kind of thing is, like, you know, it just it costs, like, so much money to do something like that that, like, you know, it's really not economically like, uh, viable. There are places that like, do add, like, you know, touches of, like, you know, modernist, like, you know, like stuff into their cocktail program. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I think, I think eventually as our public transportation, as our dining, as, as we get to, you know, get better as a social dining community here in Los Angeles, that, like, the more specialized um, experiences, like, you know, like, the, you know, like, chef, like, Kase, like, you know, kind of, like, you know, like, Urasawa experience, and everything like that will be able to, like, you know, pop up at a, like a slightly smaller price point. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Josh, for being here tonight and sharing your experience and sharing your inspirations with us. I also wanted to thank Cross Campus. Is Becky available to come here to give a few words about Cross Campus? No, that's all right. Um, well, Anna and a lot of us are entertaining tonight, and we hope you continue to join us. Um, this is a series, so we're planning our next one in, the, in a couple months. Um, but in the meantime, we have uh, several other fun events for you to look forward to. Um, our next one is next month on March 18th. It's called Love Wise, the science behind thriving relationships that we call on campus. So you can come and learn how to have those happy, healthy relationships. Um, and then on April 23rd, we're having our rescheduled event. It's Healthy Living, Healthy Skin. So find out how to um, take better care of your skin. Um, like us on Facebook, but give us feedback. Angela, Glory, Alice, and I look forward to hearing from you in terms of how this event went and how um, your experience was and if you want any other type of events in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.